Welcome into the October 27th episode of the Lockdown Leafs podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. Leafs with a big lineup shakeup ahead of tonight's game in San Jose. Dave and I will be reacting to those changes and preview the game tonight against the San Jose Sharks. All that more coming up on today's edition of Lockdown Leafs. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello and welcome into the Logged On Leafs podcast, one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's Brother on TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. Joining me, it's my co-host Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet, also a writer for the NHLPA. Locked On Leafs is a daily Maple Leaf-centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe for free. Wherever you get your podcast from, you can also now catch us up on video format on YouTube. Just search up Locked On Lease on YouTube. Hit subscribe, hit the little notification bell, and get new videos directly to you each and every day, Monday through Friday, all Leafs, all the time. Uh, David, lots of news to get into. Uh, let's just not, you know, beat around the bush here. Massive shakeup. In, uh, in the lines in Toronto, the configuration of the lineup of Toronto is vastly different to what it has been through the first seven games. Um, do you do you think this is like a bit of a, a Hail Mary here from Sheldon Keith to finally see if something could get through to these guys to get them to 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 you know buy in and start playing with some purpose here? I think it's it's something right. You can't just you know, keep going with the same thing, hoping for a different result if it's just – if it's not getting through to the players. So what what makes it work? For certain guys, it's promoting those who he believes are earning of the opportunity and those who – but in this case, I don't know if that's specifically what he's trying to do, or at least that's what he – at least he said that's not what he's trying to do. But I think there's – it's a subtle way to say he's not – he's not opposed to making changes if – changes are needed we, we've seen him do it but only in small tweaks this is probably the bigger biggest change you can expect without totally blowing things up yeah and I, I i hope that it works why don't we uh why don't we go ahead and show you exactly what the lines look like i got it here actually pulled up uh, and i can i can screen share for those who are watching on youtube and then for those who are listening via the podcast uh well go check us out on youtube it's, it's sometimes it's you, you can see our faces, but we can also show you things. So like we're doing right now here, uh, this, these are the lines uh, that we're looking at right now. David also tweeted these out in their practice yesterday. So Alex Foot has been moved up to the top line with Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. The second line remains intact, Robertson, Tavares, and Nylander. They've probably been the team's most consistent, best line, I would say, so far this season. So no need to change uh, those guys, I suppose. So Bunting moving down to the third line. Yarncroc moving into the middle of the ice. Gino Mulligan getting back into the lineup in as the third line right winger, which I thought was a little surprising. Uh, Zach Aston Reese, David Camp, and Pierre Engvall um, make up the rest of the lineup as the fourth line with Wayne Simmons and Abe Kubel uh, taking the night off. So. That's what we got going on uh, in the forward group. The D group remains pretty much the exact same status quo. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But, you know, the forward lines, the decision to um, move Kerfoot up onto the top line and move Bunting down to the third, uh, what do you make of it, Dave? I just think that top line needs to be producing better at five on five. And just something, even if it's just a temporary, just to kind of read – just kind of get things going. I don't mind it. Kerfoot, you know, if some some will say, ah, like he hasn't really done much this season. Others will say, well, he's putting in a decent effort, and you know, maybe just his skill set will will just get Os Matthews and Mitch Marner going a little bit here. But um, and Michael Buddy hasn't exactly been playing at a top line caliber winger so far this season, so I can. I, I don't mind the move. I, I, I do think it's just going to be a temporary thing because uh, Sheldon Keefe will like to have that Bunting-Matthews-Marner trio 
back together when everything is going right. So I'm not I'm not surprised that he's trying it. Um, but I don't think we should read into this as like the long term plan going forward. Probably not. Um, what he did say, the reasoning for the big shakeup was because he has not been happy with the uh, lack of production in the bottom six. So, you know, the, the production that Tavares and Nylander have been giving him, and I guess Marner and Matthews, although the actual production, like the real goals, have not been dropping, uh, the process has been there and they've looked all right. They've played well and eventually they're going to start going in for these guys. Um, and, and he feels that's the case. But he hasn't liked what the bottom six has given him. They haven't even had enough looks to allow him to think that uh, that that the offense is going to come. And, you know, he wanted to try and balance out the scoring. And that's what he said yesterday in practice as to why he decided to make the lines the way they were. So he thinks bunting can kind of go down there and help a little bit, beef up that third line um, with Yarncroft and Mulligan. And that's, I'm assuming, why Mulligan was put on that third line. So there'll be a bit more of a scoring touch. Uh, down there, and then Aston Reese, Camp, and Engvall, very much of a, of a defensive situation got going there. Um, I, I, what I like about that trio in particular is, you know, Camp last year we found played played at his best when he had some speed. And if you looked at that fourth line all season when it was Camp, Aston Reese, and Abe Kubel, their zone exits have not been well; they've been inexistent, which is why they've been hemmed in a lot in their own zone. Um, Engvall is the king at zone exits because he's got some speed and he can carry the puck um, with some poise. What he does once he gains the offensive zone is not a whole lot, but at least he can bring the puck out. So I think that's why they 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 like that. And, and Camp played best when he had some speed on his wings to do that last year, to turn that defense into offense when he was alongside, whether it was Engvall uh, and Kasha or it was Engvall and Mikheyev. So they're hoping that that can maybe spark something uh, as well with Aston Reese uh, with them at, on that fourth line. But ultimately, I think uh, to your point, when it comes to Alex Kerfoot up on the top line, I think it makes a lot of sense that he was the one who got put up there just because I think he's earned it. Like he's probably, he's been one of the more steady, hardworking players out there on the ice all season long. Like he's been rather consistent, I would say. So I think he's actually earned the spot up top, yeah. but I actually see this as a little bit of a bullet from Keith. Like it, we've talked about this before. We've talked about it a lot on the show. Like, you know, he used that one bullet real early in training camp where he stopped and said, we're not playing good enough. We're not playing effing hard enough. Let's effing go. And he kind of sent shockwaves through training camp, like day two, which was very much unheard of, but spoke to kind of the, the pressures that he's feeling that he wasn't getting from his group. And then through the bullet after game one against Montreal, calling that performance unacceptable. Game one, unacceptable. And then uh, we, we you know, heard the comments after the Arizona game coming out and saying, you know what, this, you know, our elite players aren't playing like elite players. He later walked those back for whatever reason. But, you know, I, I think I look at this as, okay, he's, he's said and done a lot. His last kind of bullet that he can do is really is, shake the lineup up and maybe that could wake guys up and get them going a little bit. Um, so that's kind of what I make of the, like breaking up that top line and moving Kerfoot up there and, and taking bunting off. Perhaps that's a little bit of a shot and a wake up call and a, a, a heap hail Mary type of move for, for Shelton Keith to finally get something going with that line. And it's not like they're not getting chances. It, it's just, you know, the, the, the luck is they've had a little bit of bad puck luck and, I don't know. Maybe some sort of change can change the fortunes of that line. Um, but you know what? I don't mind what this is looking like right now. Did I anticipate Kerfoot being a top line winger? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't even like him as a second line winger. No. But I think Matthews and Marner are good enough, and Kerfoot's willing enough to you know do do some of the the uh, the little things that he needs to do to be on that line. He's quick enough to. Um, he's got the pace to play with those guys. So. I don't mind it. We'll see what it looks like tonight in, in San Jose. Um, but overall, I I, I kind of dig what uh, what Keith is doing here. Just a, a little shake up. Yeah, he he's got to do something because this he when you see how this Leafs team has the the output of what they you know the effort's been better. I kind of mentioned that on yesterday's show that the effort you can see the efforts improving, but the results are not there. 
And you know what? Maybe there's also some defensive, you know, there's defensive reasons too why this move is being made. It's not all just to get offense going. Defensively, there has been some issues with this team, especially a five on five. Well, and it's not just like the defense themselves, right? No. Like we're also talking about the forwards playing defense. And I think that's where you can also look at that line who at, at five, like that top line at five on five who have been scored on um, just as many times as they, as they've scored. So there's no goal differential. They're, they're dead even right now. And that's not what you expect and anticipate from that line. Maybe someone who's a little bit more steady in his own end, like Alex Kerfoot, uh, you know, that, that could also point to why he was chosen as the guy to move up with those guys. Yeah, so it's it's something that's been needed in terms of just getting this team back on track to where it was last year. It went through struggles last year. Austin Matthews wasn't exactly firing on all cylinders in October, and maybe that's okay. a, you know that's that's what maybe can ease a little bit of the concern so far this season. But you don't want to see it happening two years in a row, and I think Sheldon Keith realizes that. Uh, absolutely, um, I've got some numbers about the lack of of scoring at five on five and the lack of depth scoring and why I want to know if you find these numbers concerning to you or you think it's a trend because you were talking about trends yesterday on the show. Thanks for filling in, by the way, did a great job. Um, I want to know if you're concerned or if you feel like these will be corrected over the course of the season. So I'll dig into those numbers and let you know what those are in just a moment. Uh, and then we'll also tee up tonight's game against the San Jose Sharks. And before we get into all that, though, betonline.net is your number one source for hockey betting to start the season. Find all your latest player development, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth analysis on every game. And as always, BetOnline remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. It's the fast and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, NFL, NBA, and golf. Head to the website today and use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline, it's where the game starts. Welcome back into the Locked on Leafs podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. We are hosts here at Locked on Leafs, a daily Maple Leaf-centric podcast. If you haven't already subscribed to our show, we would appreciate it if you did, if you enjoy the content that you're listening to. If you are a self-proclaimed Leafs fan, you got to be subbed up to us here at Locked on Leafs because we keep you up to date yeah. with everything going on in Leaf land. We give you some decent analysis, I would like to think. Hopefully you believe it. believe so as well. And uh, just join the community. We also got a Discord, Locked on Leafs Discord channel. You can go check out as well. I believe we can put that in the show notes down below if you want to join up. That's always popping off on game days. And uh, it's, it's you know, some really good, uh, also really good discourse that goes on in the Discord. So go check that out as well. Um, so, Dave, th- there's there's been a, a little bit of a, a, a chatter about and lack of scoring from the bottom six, and, and that being Sheldon Keefe's reason for the shakeup <clears throat> that he's made in this bottom six. So uh, I actually ended up looking into the numbers a little bit, breaking down last year what we were getting from the big boys in the bottom six and then what's happened so far this season. So last year, Dave, uh, the Leafs scored in total 312 goals, 179 of those coming from the core four plus bunting. After that, the rest of the team accounted for 133 goals of secondary plus tertiary, I guess, goal scoring, which is good for 1.62 goals per game. So outside of the core four plus bunting, they were getting 1.62 goals per game from everybody else. So far this year, the depth scoring has dropped a little bit. It's only been seven games, granted, small sample size. But they went from uh, scoring 1.62 to 1.14 goals per game. So that's almost half a goal per game that the team is leaving on the table. And through seven games, half a goal, three and a half goals. How many of these games have been, I mean, despite playing poorly in Montreal and in Arizona, those are basically one goal games. You know what I mean? Like uh, up until the empty netter in, in Arizona, like that, that was a one goal game. Right. So you get that goal by Kerfoot also that got disallowed. But like if that counts, 
you know, that's that that's a game that goes into overtime. You can pick up points, and maybe this conversation's way different uh, that we're talking about right now because they picked up two points in that game instead of zero. Um, so is that a, a concern to you, the fact that early on, I mean, there's been a lot of changes to that bottom six. McKayev's gone. Um, you haven't gotten what you expected out of Engvall so far this year. Uh, Kasha is is gone. There's no uh, Jason Spezza, who at time provided you some offense last year. So where do you sit? Are you are you concerned about this trend? Are you concerned about the lack of scoring in the bottom six? Or do you think eventually, once these guys kind of get their feet under them, it'll it'll kind of even out to roughly where it was a year ago? I think there's, there's definitely a little bit of concern given that we know that the bottom six was, wasn't was exactly going to be lighting the world on fire, but you needed them to be able to find a way to contribute once in a while. And the fact that they're they're kind of struggling to, it, it kind of just points to, to like, you know, the amount of pressure it's putting on the big boys to have to produce, right? Teams can, you know, zero in on the Leafs' top six, and then if they get burned by the bottom six for a goal, they're okay. Other teams are okay with that because they don't expect it to happen all too often. That's something that definitely has to change for the Leafs if they expect to get back to being a respectable threat in the NHL. That's that's really where we're at, where we're at right now. And there's some guys who were given some pretty you no know, nice raises, even though they're not getting a, a lot of money. But for bottom six, they're they're getting paid decently, and so that's something that I think. With these moves, like Sheldon keeps got to hone that in and say, we got to be better because we expect you guys to be better. And we saw it in preseason that some of these guys can be better. You know, it's not preseason is just, to, you know, kind of the just to get things going. You got to eventually start showing that you can get it done in the regular season. That's what they're paid to do. So we got to I, I think, um, yeah, that's got to be something that's got to change and it's got to change on this road trip. Yeah, absolutely. They definitely got to start uh, putting some pucks in the back of the net from from up and down the lineup. And, you know, looking at <clears throat> a third line of Bunting, Yarncroc, and Mulligan, that seems to be what they're hoping to get out of uh, out of that line is a little bit more offense. And even with Engvall being able to transport the puck from defensive zone into the offensive zone, they're hoping to also maybe just get a couple more opportunities and create a little bit more um, on the fourth line. One other stat that I kind of was mind blown about, Mitch Marner, five on five shooting. I'm going to ask you this question. Maybe you already know it. Maybe you, you saw the number there. But how many shots would you do you think Mitch Marner has so far through seven games at five on five? How many shots on goal? Seven games. I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with 35. Like shots on goal. Oh, on goal. On goal. Yeah. on goal. On goal. I'm going to go with 18. I'm going to go low. Seven. Seven. He has seven shots on goal through seven games at five on five. Wow. That, so like that, initial, that's my change. initial thought was going to be way off. Wow. So he said 35. I was like, God, I'm talking about on net here, pal, not attempts. I don't even know if he's at 35 shot attempts, but you're way off on wow. the 35. Jeez. But yeah, seven shots on goal. Um, and for a guy who broke out last year as a scorer and everyone all off seasons, like, Oh, if he continues this into next year, he could be a 40 goal scorer. He becomes a threat on that line. And maybe, Oh, maybe that opens up space for Austin Matthews. And maybe he could be a threat on the power play to score now, which could open up space for other guys. Hasn't quite been the case early on this year. So, you know, it's not only the bottom six, it's the top six too. It's the top line that hasn't been getting the production. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm not worried about it. I, I think that Austin Matthews, <clears throat> he's getting a lot of opportunity, but Mitch Marner to me just needs to shoot a, a little bit more because I think he's got a good shot and I think it could hit the, the back of the net a lot more often than maybe he thinks it can. Uh, that's one other uh, somewhat concerning trend, I suppose, is the lack of shots and the lack of personal creation, I suppose, is what that means that Mitch Marner, is creating at five on five. Funny enough, little statistic, individual expected goals per 60. <clears throat> Mitch Marner leads the league in this category shorthanded at two and a half expected goals per 60 shorthanded, but like 0. 0.42 per 60 
at five on five. So he's more dangerous by himself, shorthanded this season so far than he has been when he's out there at five on five trying to create for himself. Just a little little factoid that I want to throw out there for yourself. I was digging into some of these numbers yesterday that I wanted to put out there. So, you know, although there's a lot of pressure on Matthews not scoring, Marner also not scoring, and it's not – you know, it's the process isn't hasn't really been there either. He's got to start shooting pucks on goal. Uh, really quickly before we kind of break down tonight's game, um, I do want to get your thoughts on the blue line because they did not get a shakeup. But I think we could argue that the blue line was horrid in the last game against uh, against Vegas. But the rolling out with the same six, rolling out with the same exact pairs. Did you have any comments on that? Were you surprised to see that given the shakeup we saw up top? Or is it kind of just indicative of, of where the Leafs are at with all the injuries and there's just really not a whole lot of options? Yeah, they just don't have much. Like, you, like you know, maybe once in a while you can maybe reward somebody from the Marlies who's had a good opportunity. But, like, is that going to be enough to put – like, it's that's not really what the issue with the Leafs is right now. The, the issues are the top four – and until, you know, realistically, Timothy Lilligren comes back, you're not really able to change much in that top four. So, yeah, I... I oh. Lilligren, by the way. No, no, if you saw this, uh, he's doing a conditioning stint right now with the Marlies. Had a great play last night. Nice little assist. Made a couple good defensive plays as well. He looks like he's he's going to be close to returning. Yes, which would be great. Uh, great for the Maple Leafs, obviously. Um, when he returns, because it's they, they they could use they a little Lily, they use a little Lily in that uh, in that lineup. All right, we'll take one more break. Uh, when we get back, uh, Shalgren actually gets the start, so we'll we'll, we'll kind of get your thoughts on that and uh, tee up tonight's game with our three uh, three keys to the game with the Leafs in San Jose tonight. Another late one, Dave. Ten thirty puck drop. Ten thirty. Which means we will probably have to do the podcast in the morning, uh, so it might be a little bit later than than typical. That's that's what happens when they're on the West Coast. We can't be up till two thirty in the morning doing these podcasts. We both both have to get up and work the next day, but we will get you a podcast. All right, welcome back into the Locked On Lease podcast. I'm Mike DeStefano with Dave Morsudi. Um, so Maple Leafs in San Jose tonight, they officially start the California port portion of their West Coast road trip. And I mean, they 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 got to respond tonight, right? Like they have to after that performance in Vegas, right? They had a couple days off to regroup. They had the, the day out off directly to party their faces off. And then yesterday, get back into the swing of things, <clears throat> get back into practice mode, have a good hard practice. Have another good morning skate today, and then have their their game tonight. They gotta come out ready to rock. They do. No, they really do. Like the San Jose Sharks have not exactly been a great team this season. No, they've they haven't been. No, it, it wasn't expected to be a good season for them. But the Leafs can't take this team lightly. There's still some talented players on this team, and they know it. And the and the Sharks know they're gonna get underestimated and. The, the Leafs can't fall into that trap again. They have no, there's no reason why the Leafs should not be underestimating opponents, uh, you know, going forward. And I hope that in the effort we saw, like in Winnipeg, comes back against the San Jose Sharks and we don't see the repeat of Vegas. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that there's not like the rivalry and the animosity that's towards uh, Winnipeg that there is in San Jose. So, someone's got to dig deep to find that uh, to, to find the way to play that way. But yeah, absolutely. It'd be great to see um, Eric Shogren though, gets the start tonight or yeah, over Ilya Samsonov. And why I find that particularly interesting is because there's also a back-to-back this weekend. So presumably that means that Shogren is going to get the nod in two of the next three games here um, on to, to kind of close out this road trip. Did that surprise you a little bit? It, it, I actually kind of thought this might have been the case just because, you know, I, I mentioned on, on yesterday's show that, you know, Ilya Samsonov, while he's putting up great numbers, he actually, you know, one thing you don't want to do is kind of overexert him because he hasn't played 
a whole like a whole lot in his career. He's not used to the 50 game workload they usually see starting goaltenders put up. And the fact is, Shogren last played on the 17th. So that would have been yeah, back when they played Arizona. To have him sit until let's say realistically, if he gets the second game of the back to back, which seems likely against Anaheim, that's a long time for him to be sitting out. So it kind of makes sense. You get him into this game. He gets himself back into a routine and a rhythm of playing. And then he can do that back-to-back and not have such a long layoff. And look, backup goaltenders have to be used to the long layoffs. I do get that. But I think this is also like Elias Samsonov has seen a, a heavy do- heavy workload. And you just got to manage that a little bit. So I'm not surprised that Shogren's getting the, getting the start for that reason. But I also just like... Samson has been so good. You kind of want to, you know, ride the hot hand as much as possible. But you also have to be mindful that it's October. You don't want to burn out your starting goaltender in October. Yeah, that's that. That's a really good point, actually. So I guess it's it's when you really break it down, maybe it's not as um, as odd of a decision, I suppose, as as maybe initially thought. Um, so actually, I, I like your reasoning, and maybe that's why. Uh, Sheldon Keefe decided to go there to just make sure that, you know, y- you keep Samson off as fresh as possible because he's not used to this type of workload. Um, looks like Capo Kakinen, though, is going to get the start and goal for the oh. San Jose Sharks. So our guy, James mm-hmm. Reimer, not mm-hmm. getting the start. Don't get to watch Optimus Rhyme tonight. How upsetting is that? Steve Dangle's gaining his wish of not potentially seeing James Reimer get scored on. That's what <laughs> – that's – that's why the Sharks are doing this. Phil did score his uh, his I saw 400 that. goal against James. Actually, we have James Reimer on on Leafs lunch today. I, I we did the pre tape the interview yesterday after practice, and I jokingly was like, "How'd you feel about giving up your 400? Giving up, you know, the 400th of Phil's goal to him on the night he was celebrated for breaking the Ironman streak? You know, were you happy for him? Like, how'd you feel about it?" And he jokingly was like. Yeah, you know, we're old teammates, and I always like to do best by my teammates, so I kind of let him score that one, give him uh, give him a little something to celebrate extra that night. And I thought that was kind of funny. He's like, no, I actually had no idea he was sitting on 399 until uh, they started making a big deal about it. But that uh, was kind of a funny answer. Uh, but, yeah, so it, but he's not going to be in goal tonight. It's going to be Capo Kakinen. And uh, what are his numbers so far on this year, actually? So far this season, 873 save percentage and 0 and 3 record on the year. So, we're going to shut on this game. That's exactly where we're going with this, aren't we? Yeah, it's probably he's due for a big game. Let's just say that he's due for a big game. Maybe the goalie discussion will be happening tomorrow. I hope not, but maybe that will be happening. I don't know, but uh, Toronto certainly it's it's a big game for them, and they're going to have to come out uh, on fire, uh, if you ask me. Um, so let's kind of break it down. Three keys to tonight's game, Dave. Give me one. Uh, better effort defensively in your end. So avoid the turnovers. Yeah, that's a pretty good key there. Pretty solid key. Here's one for you. Start on time for the love of God. When that puck drops at 1030 tonight, be ready to play. I don't want to sit there for 10 minutes, watch you around. Watch you skating around, looking like a chicken with your head cut off for the first 10 minutes of the period again. I can't. I don't want to do it. I really don't want to do it. I need you to start on time each period, every single period, and just control the game from start to finish. Yeah. Please. Please. Just give me give me a solid 60-minute effort. Give it to me. Come on. I'm going to need the top line. This is going to be my second. I'm going to need the top line to continue putting in the effort. It, the goals will come, but they got to keep getting into those dirty areas. It will like you're not going to have what happened against Logan Thompson, where he miraculously stops that 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 chance in front of the on Austin Matthews. Likely not going to happen that many times over again. So you just got to keep working at it. The goals will come. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I I I completely agree. They will come, and that's you know leads to one of my um one of my keys also, which is just. Get pucks on net. Just get pucks on net, fluster the goaltender. Clearly, Kakadin uh, hasn't gotten off to a good start this year, so he might be down the dumps. He can catch him off guard. Um, like an 870 save percentage is 
ugh, that's pretty gross for uh, for a goaltender so far on the season. So get, get shots on goal and then go hard to the net. Try and pick up some rebounds. Put some trash in the back of the net. And, you know, that that that's how I, I want to see you. That means going into the dirty areas, you know, putting a little bit of elbow grease into the game tonight and, um, you know, go in there and make it uncomfortable for Kakinen, who's off to uh, a tough start to the year. Don't make it easy on him right? Get those shots off in the high danger areas and get them sweating a little bit and get them sweating early, get them sweating often. And hopefully he can fold like a table and uh, they could be point night for the Toronto Maple Leafs instead of talking about getting goalied. So that's, th those are a couple of keys that I got uh, for tonight's game. Uh, it's, it's a big one, man. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's only game eight. I understand. But I'll say this, it was game eight last year against the Chicago Blackhawks where the, the team finally kicked it into high gear and went on to have the best season in, in their history, regular season at least, in their history. So perhaps game eight is, is kind of a good barometer here, a good chance for them to turn the tides of the season and really get her going. So let's hope that that all begins tonight in San Jose. Puck drop at 10.30. Uh, that'll do it for Dave and I here today uh, on the podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked on Leafs podcast on all podcasts and platforms and receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti. Also the show at Locked on Leafs. Uh, we'll be back with another episode tomorrow mm, late morning. I suppose would be when it will get uploaded around like, yeah, late morning, probably considering yeah. the, uh, the late game, but we'll have an episode for you guys to listen to tomorrow. Um, we'll be back. Uh, yeah. Tomorrow we'll recap tonight's game and tee up the back to back in, uh, in SoCal with the, uh, with the Kings and the ducks, but until then keep it locked right here on locked on Leafs.